Picture this. You're standing before the tower, a powerful symbol of upheaval, as cosmic energy's raw power tears down the structures of an old epoch to pave the way for the new. That's the scene depicted in the tower card, tied to the Mars's furious energy and signaling profound transformation. In this dismantling, freedom from life's prison is found, not through destruction, but through liberation from the confines of organized existence. But the tower isn't just about destruction. It's a duality, a symbol of enlightenment and rebirth. Imagine the Eye of Horus, reminiscent of Shiva, where the blink heralds universal annihilation, yet for those with understanding it signals the beginning of wisdom. Deep in the waters of the occult, the tower also whispers secrets only known to the initiated, where the unmatched power of magic breathes. Transitioning from destruction to hope, we reach the star, a card that sings of cosmic harmony and the infinite potentials of existence. Visualize the goddess Nuith, the starry night sky personified, pouring the waters of life, milk, and oil in an everlasting cycle of rejuvenation. Here, reality is stripped to its essence, nothingness with twinkles, and every drop signifies the eternal dance of creation and dissolution. The star offers a vision where energy spirals in the ecstasy of renewal, a reminder that our perceived reality, what we think is straight or direct, might just be a curve from a grander perspective, a universal secret revealed through geometry and nature's patterns. Now plunge into the depths of the moon, the card that holds the mystery of endings and the anticipation of rebirth alike. In this nocturnal landscape, the sacred beetle carries the sun, promising the inevitable dawn. But this path is not without peril. It's lined with deceit, urging a reliance on primal senses and the will to defy illusions that shroud vision. Before you are the twin sentinels, the jackal-headed Anubis and his kin, guardians of the threshold between life and death. They stand as a test, a challenge to the spirit embarking on a journey that teeters between terrifying delirium and profound revelation. Together these cards from Part 3 of the Book of Toth weave a tapestry of life's most profound transitions. From chaos comes order, from the darkest night, the brightest star, and from the most profound depths, the ascent to dawn. This is the story of our collective unconscious, a story of human soul's passage through trials towards the ultimate truth. Welcome back to our deep dive into the Book of Toth as we explore the mysteries encoded within its tarot. We find ourselves in the heart of the third part, Segment 2, where we decipher the astounding imagery and profound symbolism of the tarot cards 19th, the Sun, XX, the Aeon, and XX1, the Universe. The Sun card is a beacon of freedom, symbolizing the enlightenment that breaks chains and uplifts the spirit. It represents Heruraha, a deity signifying the Sun in its fullest spiritual and physical glory. The zodiac signs encircle the card, implying a cosmic order, while the dancing children at the base suggest an age of innocence and liberty. A green mound capped by a red wall indicates controlled aspiration. This energy propels us into an era away from old-world constraints like sin and death, instead offering support derived from the fusion of the rose and cross. Transitioning to the Aeon, we're reminded that old structures are being overturned in favor of new eras. The imagery starkly breaks from tradition, indicating a new message of elemental forces and celestial beings. Nuith and Hadith symbolize boundless potential in reality's essence, with their union birthing Horus encapsulating the new Aeon's essence. This card marks a shift in the cycle of existence. The resurrection motif of the previous Aeon depicted through the Last Judgment is replaced by a rebirth in endless possibility, signified by the figures rising up to embrace the spirit of the times. Finally, the Universe card culminates the Tarot's journey. A dancing figure orchestrates the perfect balance of forces surrounded by the elemental cherubim, showcasing a universe in harmony. This card is the essence, the Ath, the Alpha and Omega, where the fool's journey into manifestation returns to the void from whence it began. Meditation is urged for deeper understanding as we contemplate a universe that is a celebratory dance of completeness surrounded by circles that reflect the divine order of the cosmos. In these cards, we've traversed from liberating enlightenment through the sun, witnessed the transition of ages with the aeon, and arrived at the grand cosmic dance of the universe, where the completion of the great work is observed. 
These profound symbols layer over one another to craft a narrative of human evolution, spiritual awakening, and the cyclical nature of the cosmos. With each card, we discover not only a piece of the greater universal tapestry, but also the intricate connections that bind the individual journey to the whole. Stay tuned as we continue to unravel the esoteric threads woven into the rich tapestry of the Book of Toth. Peering into the depths of esoteric knowledge, we delve into the tarot's mysteries as presented in Segment 3 of Part 3 of the Book of Toth. At the heart of the card, the tableau of matter unfolds. The 92 chemical elements forming the material world dance around a central wheel of light that embodies the tree of life and the ten principal celestial bodies. Herschel, Uranus, the symbol of disintegration, marks the abyss, while the card's realm thrums with planets from Pluto to Earth, encapsulating the cosmic spectrum. This tree of life, however, remains cloaked to all but those with the purest hearts. The traditional darkness of the card has been lifted in this new aeon. Resplendent colors now seize the tableau, with Earth reborn in a lustrous green and Saturn's sapphire deriving from the velvet night sky. The vivid hues of this card sing a song of evolution and fulfillment, reflecting the rich tapestry of the material world now transformed by the brilliance of enlightenment. Transitioning to the appendices, we find essays expanding upon the tarot's essence, starting with an exploration of silence. This concept, far from a mere absence of sound, is the emblem of ultimate equilibrium, a silent symphony that harmonizes all contradictions. Harpocrates, as the god of silence, isn't stagnant but dynamic, a key to every enigma. This silence results from an answered riddle, radiating purity and perfection. It's a state of being beyond mere existence, a paradigm of profound tranquility that cones with attaining true, innocent wisdom. Furthering our comprehension, the appendices reveal the intertwined nature of wisdom and folly. The discourse takes us on a heraldic journey through symbols, myths, and numerology, highlighting the fool's path as one of pure intuition. The path of the pure fool is likened to that of Parsifal, the embodiment of innocent ardor who embodies the energy to heal and integrate. Diving deeper, the oracle of the supreme is none other than this same fool, green as spring, vibrant as life itself. The fool is the catalyst in esoteric lore, representing the sum of all complexities resolved into the pristine simplicity of the Tao. This figure of the fool, a harbinger of infinite potential, is intimately linked to the vision sparked by the so-called sacred herb of Arabia, a metaphor for an illuminating experience that defies the constraints of time, evoking myriad, iridescent images that transcend normal understanding. In this vision, the metaphysical ladders symbolize processes or changes in thought that serve as conduits to higher truth. Every thought, regardless of its origin, can serve as a starting point for meditation that ascends towards ultimate consciousness, a pilgrimage that culminates in the holy sanctuary of truth. As we traverse through these teachings, it becomes clear that every symbol and every mystery in the tarot is a portal, a ladder leading us to a higher understanding of truth and the universe, awash with the vibrancy of newfound knowledge. Through the tarot, we explore the fusion of science, spirituality, and cosmic beauty, unlocking the secrets that lie within and beyond the veil of the material world. In the heart of Part 3, Segment 4 of the Book of Toth, we plunge into the essence of a mystical approach to understanding the universe. The text emphasizes the necessity of being deeply rooted in a particular law that acts as a foundation for the exercises it describes. It signals the importance of integrating all aspects of thought, concepts, and their opposites into one cohesive vision of perfection. The journey here is about marrying each thought with its contradiction, dissolving dualities into a single amalgam. This alchemical marriage of ideas isn't merely academic. It's a vivid, kinetic process that requires a mind that is quick, well-versed, and ready to respond to the mercurial flow of insights. Picture this. Your thoughts are sparks darting across the vast night sky, where hesitation is the only sin. It breaks the chain of illumination that leads towards higher consciousness. We then encounter an advanced concept, the triumphant resolution of dichotomies in the upper realms, where contradiction becomes unity, not through negation, but through the encompassing of all dichotomies within themselves. This passage not only tasks your intellect, 
but challenges your entire being, urging you to leap beyond thought itself, rendering concepts like reincarnation and linear progression as mere shadows of a grand, interconnected, and possibly infinite cosmos. Mystical intoxication is celebrated as a method for gaining rapid comprehension and synthesis of life's myriad experiences. It is as if the insights that take years to grow in the sober mind can, with the aid of the holy herb, bloom instantaneously. The narrative compellingly articulates that all paths, regardless of their apparent divergence, converge into a singular path of light. Through this synthesis, we understand that personal growth is a process of stepping through planetary consciousness towards the ultimate source, where we become fire finer than any mundane flame. Finally, we dive into the symbol of Mercury, the caduceus, with its numerous allegories and layers. Mercury embodies contradiction and duality, cunning and revelation, depth and deceiving simplicity. The symbol of the caduceus, with its intertwining serpents, represents the journey of unification, carrying a message of life and transformation that touches all dimensions of existence. These profound symbols and archetypes build into a climax where the microcosm and macrocosm bind, and all duality is resolved into a state of completion and ecstasy, a key to the grand mystical visions that the text heralds. What emerges from this segment is a dense tapestry of symbolic understanding, esoteric knowledge, and a clarion call to transcend mere intellectualism for the pursuit of a profound, unified understanding of the existential ecstasy that underlies the facade of our constructed realities. In the midst of an ethereal realm, the vision received is both grandiose and intricate, revealing a deity of indescribable might and terror. This deity possesses a thousand arms, each wielding a formidable weapon. The god's face is more terrifying than a storm, his eyes shoot lightning, and from his mouth flows a sea of blood. Upon his head rests a crown adorned with symbols of death, and his forehead is marked by both the upright Tao and signs of profaneness. Around him, a young girl clings, once resembling purity and royalty but now stained by the overpowering force of the deity, becoming rosy and yet contributing a touch of blue to his otherwise dark essence. They are locked in a fierce embrace, the deity's overwhelming might tearing the girl apart while her grip threatens to strangle him. This tormenting scene echoes with their joined cries, which, although indicative of profound suffering, resonate as a rapturous call that attests to a union so deep that every calamity across the cosmos is but a mere whisper in their tempestuous exclamation of ecstasy. An angelic voice proclaims that this vision is beyond understanding, yet insists on the pursuit of mystical union with this formidable tableau, which represents peace. An apparent paradox, as the experience of being torn from within suggests. This kind of peace is not identifiable through words or thoughts because it is born out of chaos, and every attempt to portray chaos ultimately fails as it is an inherently unintelligible entity. The narrative continues to describe a series of complex visuals, sacred Tibetan banners depicting similar godly figures, the juxtaposition of cosmic peace against warlike dualities, and polar opposites serving as facets of a single phenomenon. Following this, there's an exploration of the character Aleph, Vau, Yod, Ayin, Resh, Tau, symbolic of profound spiritual truths. The scene shifts further to describe the mystical intercourse between Babylon and the deity, with Babylon represented as the mother of abominations, intoxicating herself with the blood of saints, and birthing a virgin whose deflowering is equated with alchemical transformation and the fulfillment of the great work. The essence of this entire segment speaks of a complex, interwoven tapestry of mystical concepts dealing with duality, transformation, the union of opposites, and the attainment of spiritual peace through what might seem like a violent, chaotic process. It challenges the seeker to understand the nature of existence through an embrace of what is beyond rational understanding, symbolized by the intense and frightening imagery. The deep, allegorical meanings behind this segment of the Book of Toth reflect a depiction of divine power, ecstatic union, and the profound mysteries that accompany the pursuit of higher spiritual knowledge and truth. In the heart of our tale, we delve into the enigmatic allure of the Mother of Abominations, a central figure referred to as Babylon. She is a paradoxical entity, symbolizing both subjugation and supremacy, 
as she willingly becomes a servant to many, yet master over all. Babylon's essence embodies the very notion of universal connection and understanding because she has united herself with all life forms, understanding their mysteries, thus demonstrating a unique form of power that stems from vulnerability and union. Her beauty and desirability stem from this deep, comprehensive intimacy with living beings, a joining that transcends mere physical interaction to reach the depths of true understanding. It is this profound connection that earns her the title Understanding, the Lady of the Night who has distilled singular love into infinite expressions. Her love is a multitude, yet each act retains the oneness and equality with the One, which is the ultimate essence of love itself. She traverses a path from laws and enlightenment, opting instead for the uncharted realms of solitude and the obscure. It is in these depths, away from prying eyes, where her brilliance is veiled, yet still unfathomably potent. Her communion is spoken of as an intoxicating elixir. With her mystique compared to intoxicating wine, each sip further merging the consumer with her sublime essence. Yet the mystery of the beast she rides remains elusive. It's a secret not easily grasped by those newly acquainted with the layers of understanding this vision represents. As the vision continues, the angel revealed that those deemed saints have their essence eternally mixed within this cup. Their blood, no longer separate, signifies a deep initiation into the mysteries of Babylon. This commingling of life forces serves to rejuvenate the weary spirit of the Father a cycle that persists through the eternal renewal inherent in creation and dissolution. The narrative transcends to hint at ancient rituals and mystical orders, from the satiric play of Pan, the celebrations of Dionysus, the hidden rites of the Rosy Cross, and the profound ceremony within the Adept's vault. It's a tapestry of allegorical and literal events that signify a profound transformational process taking place within the spheres of mystical and esoteric traditions. Yet there exists a shadow, those who resist Babylon's embrace. These dark brothers, in their isolated fortresses, concoct their own bitter wine of illusion. Shrouded in selfishness and malice, they wage war against enlightenment, spreading deception while interpreting their false notions as genuine compassion and understanding. In their misguided attempts to shield against death and change, they inadvertently open the door to their own demise their covenants serving as their undoing through the agency of Koranzon, the devil of dispersion, and the personification of the second death. This passage of the Book of Toth takes us deeper into its richly woven cosmology, confronting us with the duality of spiritual enlightenment versus illusory power. It asks us to consider the nature of true understanding and the peril of rejecting universal connection, a narrative that contrasts symbiotic unity with destructive isolation. In the profundity of a mystical experience, our journey through the Book of Toth takes us through the baffling visions of the fifth ether, carrying us deeper into the metaphysical realms. Let's navigate the enigmatic revelations presented in this segment, number seven of part three, as we behold the dazzling transformation from visions to understandings that dance at the edge of human comprehension. We find ourselves in the thick of a vision where cosmic and spiritual symbols intertwine, the dragon's head merging with the tail of the ether, an imagery swirling with infinite cycles and knowledge veiled from the uninitiated. This segment envelops us in a celestial drama, where the moon's waning light underscores a profound truth. The illumination of pure wisdom trumps even the brightest celestial bodies. The arrow of truth is central, a motif rich with esoteric meanings, feathers plucked from divine entities, and a tip shining with a star's glint. Amidst the guardians and worshippers of this stellar pinnacle, none were deemed worthy to wield or gaze upon the arrow, save for those born under its auspicious sign, where the lion's head crowns the serpentine body. You must grasp the distinction between the upward and downward arrow. While the former flies true and is loosed from a steady hand, the latter plunges from the peak with precision and subtlety. Reflect deeply on these mysteries, for they construct the fabric of this cosmic tapestry. As the voice of the narrative urges withdrawal to contemplate this profound mystery, we shift to the image of a golden child, a vision both innocent and laden with ancient wisdom. The child holds red and blue serpents and speaks of life's initiatory suffering, 
identifying with Isis, the Lady of Sorrow. The kinship with nature and the embrace of Nephthys, the embodiment of perfection and the dark, feared sister, plummets us into the harrowing depths of loneliness, akin to the hermit crab's solitary existence. But this is where the true communion with mystery begins. The child identified as Eros prompts a dramatic act, requiring the seer to take his bow and shoot him, symbolizing the slaying of desires and the unveiling of deeper mysteries. Reluctantly following this divine command leads to an awakening, striking not the child but oneself, revealing the profound unity of the seer and the divine. This act erupts into a cataclysmic roar, revealing the arrow, crowned and ablaze with otherworldly flame, at once the father of all light, life, and love. Through the maelstrom of fire and darkness, the vision deepens, revealing that the arrow symbolizes infinite motion, yet paradoxically it remains stationary, an enigmatic force, the gaze of an unblinking deity that upholds the totality of existence. The ethereal voices echo, highlighting the great ungraspable mystery, below the division, above the unity, transcending the contradictions that bind the mortal mind. Ultimately, the seer is struck with the realization that their journey and suffering are universal and inescapable iniquity shared with all beings. The heart rejoices wrapped in the serpent of delight. This vision transcends the known, revealing that the contradictions of the abyss are not division but unity, a profound truth that each symbol carries its converse within, an essential alchemy for true understanding. Immersed in the enigma, where visions of the arrow are at once omnipresent and elusive, we are reminded of the elusive nature of mystical truths, often obscured by the ripples of ordinary consciousness. Yet, in that moment of clarity, revealed is the joyous heart, the serpent embracing knowledge, and the unity that rises above contradiction. Thus, the transcendental arrow remains, a beacon of immutable truth in the sea of universal mind. Immersed in the depths of the mystical experience, here in segment 8 of part 3, I confront the ultimate paradox of the visionary journey. The lords of vision, rulers of the ethereal realm I've been traversing, decree the ending of a magnificent sight, imploring me to find joy even as the marvel fades. In the fierce tussle between vivid visions and the echoes of memory, the divine winds sweep against me, sealing the aethers and leaving me with naught but my own understanding a solitary figure amidst the vastness, reduced to nothing more than a whisper of existence. The crystal gazing has grown dim. It serves now only as a vessel of remembrance, where once it was a gateway to wonders untold. Deprived of the ability to stride further into the ethers, what remains are the domains of mind and body, a reality devoid of the celestial brilliance once within my grasp. Then behold, a vision of sheer magnificence. A palace arises, each stone a prism of splendor lit by countless lunar glows. This palace, however, is no mere structure of mortar and jewel. It is incarnate as a youthful woman of unparalleled beauty, twelve years in age, shrouded in slumber, or nearly so. Her very being is a tapestry of dreams, flesh interwoven with the divine spark, each hair a conduit for the fiery spears of angelic hosts, her skin the canvas for their celestial might. Gazing upon this ethereal figure, there is no grandeur witnessed in my journey that could dare rival the simplicity of her smallest fingernail. The experience of this solitary ether surpasses all previous explorations. Though ceremonial rites bar me from partaking in this realm's quintessence, even the slightest glimpse from this distant vantage feels akin to basking in the entirety of the ethers I've encountered. Lost in a sea of awe and tranquility, I stand transfixed. The vista that crowns this virgin universe glistens with illustrious beings, a testament to the profound nature of this revelation bestowed upon me. In this segment, tranquility stems not from attainment, but from the sublime peace found in the mere act of witnessing. The seer, myself, is not bereft despite the closure of the gates, for in the recounting there's a translation of the incomprehensible, a sharing of serenity that transcends mere words a journey into the heart of wonder. As we delve into the depths of the Book of Thoth and explore segment 9 of part 3, we are greeted with a sublime and mystic figure, the daughter of Babylon. Described with a reverence bordering on religious, she is the epitome of the divine feminine, untouchable and pure, a being that transcends time and space. She is known by many names, Kore, Malka, Betula, Persephone, 
all hinting at her multifaceted essence that poets, prophets, and dreamers have sought to capture but all fall short. Her presence is such that thought, memory, and will are rendered powerless. The ordinary faculties of human perception cannot grasp her full glory. As we turn from this celestial description, we land in the world of the tarot, particularly focusing on the court cards of the deck. Here, the intricate interplay of the four elements, fire, water, air, and earth, intermingle with the zodiac, creating a complex tapestry of astrological and elemental symbolism. These court cards are essentially personified by four dignitaries, the knights, queens, princes, and princesses. Each embodies a specific aspect of the elements, resonating with different segments of the zodiac. The knights, full of swift and transient energy, like a lightning flash or strong wind, are the fiery spark of their respective element. Queens complement this with a sustained ability to receive and nurture the seed of this energy. Princes, riding forth in chariots, are the manifestation of their parents' power, bringing endurance and a more lasting impact. Lastly, the princesses grounded in material reality embody the final crystallization and silent return to non-existence. These characters are not merely fixtures in the tarot world. They come alive as types that we might recognize among us, each with characteristics influenced by the position of the sun or rising sign at birth. For instance, a character born under the influence of the Queen of Swords may embody a sharpened intellect, while having the Prince of Wands as a significant influence might confer upon them a passionate impulsivity. The segment proceeds to demystify the roles of each of these dignitaries, beginning with the Knights, who are described as the Yod in the name, representing the primal form of their element. Then, the queens are explored as the he, covering how they maintain the energy initiated by their knights. The narrative delves into the princes of the vow, who carry forth the combined strength of their predecessors, and finally the princesses, signifying the he final, stand as the last embodiment of the elemental cycle. The court card's complex relationships invite us into a deeper understanding of the ever-turning wheel of creation. This means considering each card not in isolation but in relation to one another, as they are intertwined within the endless dance of universal forces. Taking us further into the court, we get a glimpse of two representatives, the Knight and the Queen of Wands, exemplifying the fiery nature dictated by their astrological sign. The Knight, cloaked in the unpredictability of Scorpio's last decan to the spirited Sagittarius, is full of ardor and sudden action, while the queen, from the end of Pisces to the start of Aries, gives this fire a depth of color and life-sustaining energy. To fully grasp the symbolism and power of these court cards, the summary calls on us to exercise our minds, drawing correlations between these symbols and the raw natural forces they represent, a crucial element in any magical practice. In summary, section 9 of part 3 of the Book of Thoth serves as a bridge taking us from the divine and unattainable splendor of the daughter of Babylon to the more tangible yet profoundly symbolic world of the tarot court cards. It's a journey of understanding the elemental forces that dwell within us and in the cosmos, waiting to be summoned by those who dare to peer beyond the veil. Deep within the labyrinth of the human spirit, there resides a character of such complexity and contradiction that he could be seen as a walking enigma. This figure, described in the segment as a paragon of noble and generous traits, dances precariously on the edge of whimsy and pride. His opulent spirit gives rise to bouts of romantic fervor, particularly in tributes to history and tradition. His antics might be vast and laughable, even as he himself chuckles secretly at the folly. Imagine a man who could dedicate years to humorous ridicule of an unremarkable person, with no malice in his heart, and without a moment's hesitation, offer aid to that same person in times of need. This man's humor is like an omnivorous beast, devouring everything in its path, shrouding him in a mysterious mist that strikes unfounded dread into others. Now let us delve deeper into the fascinating shadows of this persona. His pride, an Everest that scoffs at any pettiness below. His courage blazes like an untamed fire, and his perseverance is as enduring as time itself. This relentless fighter, invariably outnumbered yet never outmatched, owes his victories to his phenomenal capacity to toil without desire for reward. A contradiction of sorts, he harbors a haughty disdain for the masses, 
yet each individual he reveres as a celestial being. However, when the light of this character is dimmed and his virtues corrode, what remains can be disturbing. From this corrosion emerge traits most vile, a cruel, sadistic streak, and a callous heart armored in indifference. Sloth begets intolerance, prejudice, and slovenly arrogance. Once a boisterous challenger, he might now shrink into cowardice. In our esoteric journey, we encounter the Princess of Wands, a vibrant embodiment of the earthy facet of fire. She is the very essence that fuels passion and change. Unrestrained and enrobed in flames of justice, she wields a wand crowned by the sun and dances in a vehement flame shaped like the primal letter Yod. This is a being who exudes raw energy and commands the beauty that belongs only to those who dare to fully live. The princess's spirit is a fiery comet streaking across the firmament, inspiring in her unapologetic vivacity, yet feared for her utter lack of tolerance for opposition. Love and wrath spill from her in equal measure, each unbound and overwhelming. Her towering aspirations are borne on wings of ecstatic zeal, yet she is burdened with a memory that never releases a grudge and a patience only for vengeance. Dignity lost, the Princess of Wands can be as a fading star, a theatric, a veneer of fascination with neither depth nor sincerity. She embodies cruelty, unreliability, and a domineering spirit, all cloaked behind a veil of self-deceit. Her insatiable passions, described in the 27th hexagram, I of the Yi King, are both cautioned against and enticed, painting the image of a soul in constant pursuit of indulgence without foresight. This segment from the Book of Toth draws a compelling allegory about the dual nature of character. It offers a mirror to our complexities and a window into the delicate balance that rides between virtue and vice. Whether we resonate more with the mysterious enduring fighter or the impassioned volatile princess, it urges us to reflect on our own inner fires and how we might master them for the theater of life.